your Bibles to Ephesians 2, Ephesians the second chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, and this is where we'll spend all of our time this evening, Ephesians chapter 2. It's good to see you this evening, I rejoice at these opportunities that we have to break open the book of God once more, to worship our Heavenly Father, and to encourage one another. I dearly love studying the Bible, and I, I count it as a great privilege that I get to do it all through the week and then share with you what I've been thinking on all week. I believe the challenge was take that buddy that was offered this morning. And I, I must confess, I, I actually planned this sermon with six points already. So I didn't just like sit at the house this afternoon and think, okay, how can I put together a couple more points for this lesson? It, it had six points on Thursday, okay? And, and he and I didn't even communicate that. So this is, this is totally not planned, all right? The lesson is planned, but the six points necessarily to answer Russ's six points are not. Uh, I did tell Meredith on Friday, I'm gonna preach a short lesson this Sunday. And she goes, are you sure? And I said, well, that's kind of my plan right now. I'm, I'm going to preach a short lesson this Sunday just because it's a good discipline as you're a gospel preacher to just once in a while challenge yourself like that. And then Russ gets up this morning and says, take that, buddy. It was 32 minutes and 46 seconds, and I will beat that tonight. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. We'll see if I beat that tonight. I'm not going to try. I'm just going to preach what I've got. And uh, if it works out great, then neener, 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 boo-boo on you. And if it doesn't, well, better luck next week. But I did think this is a competition the whole congregation could support, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, anyway. I, I was laying at the house this afternoon reading over this lesson and thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight. I, I want us to look at verse 14 and pay a special attention to the position that Jesus occupies. Verse 14 of Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace. Look down at verse 16. That he might reconcile. Verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you. Verse 18. For through him... We both have access by one Spirit to the Father. In the middle of this section, what we're discussing is what we have in Jesus Christ. Essentially, what we find in Jesus Christ. I know this may sound a little odd, but as I was reading over this lesson, U2 song kept coming through my mind. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I didn't actually know that song is written with a gospel twist to it. So I was reading through the lyrics. He says, I believe in the kingdom come, then all the colors will bleed into one. Bleed into one, but yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds and you loosed the chains, carried the cross of my shame. Oh, my shame, you know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I was thinking about that. I think that's sad. He describes, he describes the Christian basis of faith, the cross of Jesus Christ. And then the, the whole song is written around that chorus line. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It describes this cultural desperation for some kind of spiritual renewal. But he says, I can't find it. Well, I will tell you too, I will tell Bono if I ever speak to him. Doubt that I will. My friend, if you didn't find it in Jesus Christ, you will find it nowhere. Paul, in Ephesians 2, describes six things that we find in Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, before we break open the list, what are you looking for? Six things we find in Jesus. Let's read the text, verse 14 through the end of the chapter. Ephesians 2 14, for he himself is our peace, 
who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both back to God into one body by the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Ephesians 2 is, the, in my opinion, the crux of Ephesians, and Paul details for us six things. So here they are. Number one, in Jesus Christ we find peace. Just notice how many times that word is used in this short passage. It's mentioned several times from verses 14 through verse 17. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, there is the lack of peace, or the absence of peace, he says, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. In verse 17, he came and preached peace to you and to, and to you who were afar off and to those who were near. Folks, what we find in Jesus Christ is peace. Paul would say in Philippians 4, peace that passes understanding. It's something that's almost hard to find in a tangible form because what we're talking about is something everybody's desperately searching for and yet nobody can really vocalize or verbalize or put it into words, but we have it in the message of the gospel. You know what mankind needs? Mankind needs to live in harmony with God. And guess what the gospel provides? It provides harmony between mankind and God for all those who obey it. It restores what should be. When we go back through the biblical story and we see Adam and Eve walking in perfect fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden, in perfect harmony with God, experiencing a relationship that none of us have ever experienced. And from that point of the fall to today, mankind has been searching for that again. And through the gospel, we get a glimpse of it. We get a flavor of it that will be brought to fruition at the end of the age. What we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ is peace with God. But I want you to notice something else. It's not just peace with God. Unilaterally, it's peace. It's peace vertically with God, but it's the, at the same time, horizontally with mankind. And this is kind of one of those interesting paradoxes of the Christian faith. When we put on Jesus Christ, we are putting ourselves in God's camp and we are therefore against the world, right? But see, we're in God's camp with other people in God's camp. And so the very thing Paul's talking about in verses 14 and 15, Jewish issues, Gentile issues, no, 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 you guys are together now. And so what God does through the gospel of Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, is destroy barriers that separate people. This is a beautiful thing. You know, it's something that we here maybe in Beaumont don't, accept, or don't recognize as easily as some congregations would. You, you know, we have a, a close association with Don Truex in Tampa. And, and at one point when Don and I and, and Russ and, and some of the shepherds were visiting with Don back earlier this year, he, he made the observation that where he worships at Temple Terrace in Tampa they've got people represented from, from almost every nation in the world. That may be a bit exaggeration. There's a ton of people around the world represented in that congregation. It's not just folks who are pretty well from the South. I think I hit everybody in this room almost with that comment, didn't I? Most of the people in this room are from the South. And so we kind of, even, even if you're from the North, which Russ obviously, God bless you this morning, he said, you know, we, we still can recognize because we're all pretty well one people. We're Americans. 
But you go to a place that's a little bit more culturally diversified and you have a situation where there are people legitimately from a foreign country and their primary language is not even English. What, what Paul's talking about right here, this unity, becomes very real. But folks, that's what the gospel gives us. Peace with our fellow man because it unites us in our enemy, Satan, and sin. It unites us in our common solution, Jesus Christ. And it puts us under the banner of heaven. We are at peace. We are united despite our nationality differences, our racial differences, our previous religion. We are united because Christ Jesus brings us together. That's what we find in Jesus. You want to find true peace? You better look at Jesus. Number two, in Jesus Christ we find reconciliation. There's your $3 word. Look at verse 16. This is still part of that same discussion. This is part of that making peace discussion, verse 16, that he might reconcile them both back to, or both to God in one body by the cross by it having put to death the enmity. Restoration is part of a discussion about peace, which is why it pops up here. If we want to be at peace with God, what we need is the relationship restored. That's the idea of reconciliation. That's just a high flute and religious word, but it means restoration. What should be made right again. Folks, the gospel does that for us. Jesus Christ, through His cross, does that for us. Makes this perfect fellowship with God a possibility and an ultimate reality for all God's faithful people. I can tell you, what you're searching for is God. What you're so desperately hungry for is God. And you will find it in the person of Jesus Christ. I really like this quote by a man named Chambers. All of heaven is interested in the cross of Christ, hell afraid of it, while men are the only ones to ignore its meaning. There's a lot of depth to that comment. All of heaven focuses on the cross, and hell hates it. Folks, look at the text of verse 16. He does this by the cross. That's the center point of this discussion. That's the intersection where it all comes together in the person of Jesus Christ and in the work of Jesus Christ. We are restored back to God by His death. We find reconciliation in Christ Jesus. Number three. Through Jesus, through Him, we find God. Look at verse 18 with me. Verse 18. For through Him, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, now folks, I want, you, I want you to observe, this is not that we find God generically. Our, our culture kind of likes that nonsense. Well, you need to find your God, and you need to find God. And what they mean by that is some sort of superficial emotional feeling or nonsense that the world can provide. No, 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 no. What we find in Jesus and what we find in the gospel is God authentically and completely. We don't find a God. We find the God. We find Jesus Christ. We find the Father God. We find the Holy Spirit, who's also God. What we find, even in verse 18, is a subtle reference to the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all three represented in the verse. And here's what all three are doing in that verse, folks. All three are working through the gospel to help you go to heaven. Do you ever stop and break it down like that and really think about that? We... we we typically think of the Father who designed the plan and the, and the Son who carried it out. And so, well, the Son, the cross, we, we get that. It's all part of redemption. It's all part of the gospel. But guys, do you really stop and think? All three persons of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are preeminently concerned with you being saved. You ever given that thought? Folks, what 
what Paul's addressing here is that concern. I think if we had as much concern over our own soul that God does, we wouldn't have issues that we have sometimes. If we thought about our spiritual destiny as much as God does, we wouldn't have some of the issues that we have sometimes. If we could stay focused on it like Jesus stayed focused on it, I think we'd get a taste of what God does. All three represented in verse 18, and all three concerned about us, all three concerned about salvation, and through the gospel... We can have it. There may be something else going on in the verse that I want to point out. It's not just that we are introduced to God or or that God is identified to us. It's that we have access to God through Jesus Christ. I, I don't want to downplay that word. And I do think it's part of the reconciliation. I think it's part of the peace, which is being all over this passage. But I but I want you to really stop and think about what that means. That part of reconciliation is relationship. You see, you don't have access to somebody without some sort of a relationship with them. And through Jesus Christ, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a relationship with God. We have access to God. We can come in boldly before His throne of grace, knowing who He is through Jesus Christ. Hebrews would discuss in chapter 4. Folks, we need to give that a lot of thought. Through Jesus, through Jesus, we find God. Well, Maybe then we should discuss the negatives of that. That if you're looking for God anywhere else, you're not going to find Him. Even in class this morning, Dennis made a comment in class while we were discussing Colossians 2. In talking about John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. So if you're seeking God in any other way, my friend, you're not going to find it. You will not find Him any other way. And so our world that seeks God in pleasure won't find God in pleasure. Our world that seeks God in frivolities and fun will not find it there. Our God resides on the other side of Jesus Christ. And so we go through Him to find Him. We find God through Jesus. Are you as concerned about your soul as God is? Number four. In Jesus Christ, through Him, we find value. Now, I want you to notice... I couldn't really pick a verse for that. Because what he's discussing in this whole context is is value. But maybe it's not a value that we would typically think about. Restoration, reconciliation, peace is supremely costly. But see, when we read a word like value, what we think is our own value. That I am of value. I think that's part of this discussion because you look at what Jesus does for you. Jesus obviously places value on you. You matter to Him. But I want us to think about it from the reference point of Jesus Himself. You look at what Jesus does in this verse. Folks, in verse 14, He is our peace. He doesn't necessarily say He makes peace or He creates peace. He personifies Jesus as peace. He is our peace. He takes this wall that divides and breaks it down. In verse 15, he abolishes it in his flesh, that enmity. He creates in himself one new man from the two, and he makes peace. He reconciles both back to God in one body, and he does it by the cross. He does it by putting to death the enmity. Folks, he comes and he preaches peace to all those who are near and those who are far. And through him, we have access by one spirit to the Father. But folks, I I want you to see all of this. All of the things that we are afforded in Jesus Christ and all of the things that we are provided for by the gospel of Jesus Christ came at a great value, at a great cost. It came through the suffering and the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ.
Folks, this was costly. And so we sing the song sometimes. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Folks, do you think about that? Or are we just giving lip service to songs like that? Those are rich songs. Jesus paid it all. What do I owe him? I owe him everything. If I have peace that passes understanding, if I have a relationship with God because it's been reconciled, it's been restored, I owe Jesus everything. I owe Him my life and my well-being. I owe Him my purpose. I owe Him my time on this earth because Jesus paid the cost. Folks, we find value in this because of Jesus. And and I, I will make the point... We find value and substance in ourselves, but only because of Jesus. Yes, you matter. You matter to Him. In Him we find value. Number five. Through Him we find family. Look at verses 19 and 20. Look at verses 19 and 20. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Folks, we need to give a lot of thought to what he says in verse 19. You are not strangers or foreigners. That's a reference even back up to chapter 2 and verse 12. That when you were Gentiles in the flesh, before you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, what you were at that time, verse 12, you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, no hope, and without God in the world. That's a description of strangers. That's a description of foreigners. That's a description of those who are unwelcomed. Folks, that's a description of people without God. He says it in the verse. That's a people who have not yet been reconciled to God. You think about that. And yet, through Jesus, that's not us anymore. That's not who we are. That last half of verse 19, your fellow citizens with the saints. You're part of the household of God. Guys, we talk about the house of God sometimes. And we talk about being family. But do you really stop and think what he's talking about in verses like that? Look at where you were. And look at where you are now. I have many points in this three years I've been here told you. But folks, I want want you to understand this. When we talk about being a spiritual family, do you appreciate? You're all I've got. And I'm not the only one in this room. I have no siblings who are Christians. I have no parents who are Christians. You're it. When I say brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm looking at you. You are all I've got in this world. And I love my flesh and blood family, but you understand what I'm making, the, the, the point I'm making, the tie that binds us together is not flesh and blood, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that much deeper? Isn't that much richer? Isn't that a more powerful bond? I'm not the only one in the room that can say that tonight either. There are several people in this room that have no one else but the people right here. Folks, we start talking about verses like this where we're no longer strangers. We're not foreigners. We're not unknown. No. We are brought in to the household of God. You're not put at the kiddie table. (laughs) You're not forced to eat in the sunroom. You are brought in and you're put at the table 
beside Father God, the Son Jesus Christ. You are put into fellowship with God. Having been reconciled through Jesus Christ, you have a family. And and just because I can't stand to let it go, I'm going to make the point. When he says fellow citizens, and, and he emphasizes that, fellow citizens with the saints... It denotes that we have an equal share in the inheritance. I want you to take that, not just the fact that we're at the table together, not just the fact that we're together with God through Jesus Christ. I want you to take that one step further and acknowledge, folks. It's not just that you're welcome to the table for a short meal. It's as if God brings you to His throne and says, I'm writing your name in my will. (laughs) You ever had somebody do that at the dinner table? Me neither. And yet through the family of God, by virtue of Jesus Christ, that's what God does for us. You are welcomed, you are loved, and He provides for you. And then number six, through Him we find holiness. Look at verses 21 and 22, please. In whom, that's a reference to Jesus, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now, now folks, I want you to think about that. One of the prerequisites to fellowship with God is be holy. You think about that. One of the great themes of Leviticus, the whole reason God gives them the sacrificial law of the Old Testament, is so that they can have harmony and fellowship with a holy God, though they are unholy people. And so the admonition, Be holy for I am holy, says the Lord your God. Leviticus 11, and it's repeated in the New Testament. The underlying demand for relationship with God is met or accomplished through Jesus Christ. God requires you to be holy to have a relationship with Him. Guess what Jesus provides? Holiness. Now, I'm not discounting the fact that there's an ongoing requirement to that. We we know that. We preach on that all the time. You want to be holy? You need to go up tomorrow and live right to be holy. We get that. But the initial requirements of God are provided through Jesus Christ. That we can be holy through Him. My friends, we find our identity in Jesus Christ. We can truly be the holy structure built for His praise, for His honor, for His glory. That's what God wants for you. And guess what? You can find it in Jesus. What are you looking for? Poor old Bono. I don't figure he'll ever find it. Song says he won't. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Well, sadly, there are millions of people in this world that that would adequately describe, wouldn't it? How many people do you interact with every day that still haven't found what they're looking for? They're looking for it in a person who's not their spouse. They're looking for it in entertainment. They're looking for it in work and throwing themselves into the corporate ladder and the hustle of the world and just more money in the account and a bigger home. That'll get it. And they keep looking and searching and they keep not finding. What you truly need, what all of humanity desperately is searching for, is found only through Jesus Christ. If there's one thing I could really drive home for our young, young folks, it's that. College degree, great. More power to you. 
It will not satisfy what you really, truly need. Great spouse, that can be awesome. Ask me about it. I, I'm, I'll tell you. It's great. But if what you're looking for is a spouse to meet all your needs and you'll be happy forever, you're going to be disappointed. You better look to Jesus Christ because it's only through Him. Maybe there's somebody here this evening who's not and has went into the world and had the muck in the mire and doesn't want it anymore, is wanting Jesus. Well, that's, that's your cue. You got him tonight if you want him. Maybe there's somebody here tonight who has had Jesus before, who knows what I'm talking about, and yet struggles with the world and the deceptions therein. Come back to him. If we can assist you in some way tonight, please make it known now as we stand in